Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special podcast edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, um, edition two of the Jefferson Hour in the year 2016. We've gone back to square one, as the British say. We are going to do Jefferson 101, 102, 103. We're doing a short course. It could go on quite a while. could go on for 15. I, I love it. I really do. We're, we're walking you through Jefferson's life out of character. Now, we may interrupt this to have some in-character programs. Probably we will. But we are going to see this through. So in week one, uh, the first new program of the 2016 season, we got Jefferson born and to about the time he was going to go to college. Um, by now, his father has died. Jefferson is regards himself as essentially alone in the world. In episode two, Jefferson 102, this week, we get Jefferson to the point of marriage and to the point of starting out his political career and to the point of building Monticello. And we talked quite a bit about his character. We talked about character, debt. His romanticism. His intellectualism. uh, and, And his mentors, George Wythe and William Small. So we've gotten him through his college years at William and Mary, he's now about to decide what to do with his life. He's been trained for the law, so he's certainly going to become a lawyer. He's also a planter. He's in need of a wife. We, we talked a lot about character flaws, too. A very serious character flaw in Jefferson is his impecuniousness, his, his extravagance That's with money. That's a great word. <laughs> yeah. He's a very, he's a very weak... He has, he has very little moral discipline with respect to money. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a lot of discipline, but not self-restraint. Oh, what a perfect segue. Yeah, so that's... Discipline with respect to money. Yes. We got a letter. May I? Oh, yes, please. Um, uh, if, if you'd like to write the Jefferson Hour... Um, We're glad to, to have it. Yep, go to jeffersonhour.com. Um, we, we try to keep up with it. We don't do the best job, but we read everyone that comes in. Um, just go there and click on Ask President Jefferson. But we got a letter from a very nice gentleman by the name of Richard Lyon. And he writes, Clay and the TJ team, I just donated for the first time not sure for the delay since I've been listening religiously for a few years. Wow. Careful how you use that word. Um, you should be more pushy with listeners like me, he says. Maybe a line like, quote, Come on, seriously, how many hours have you spent engulfed in this work? It's not free to produce, you know. Don't be a moocher. Any amount will do, unquote. That wow. Was a, a good delivery. Uh, if, if, 50, says, if 52 people would give $1,000 each, our problems would be solved. I'm not sure. Fifty-two people, a thousand dollars each. You know, each. you'd want to order that latest telescope and, and some, some more, more wine. And wine, and yeah. Anyway, says thank you for the hundreds of mind widening and horizon expanding episodes. Wow. Keep it up, and to that you would say, "You're welcome, sir." Um, you're welcome, and and our gratitude is complete. When I read the correspondence, uh, it's very moving to me to think that there's someone out there in Norfolk or in Colorado Springs or in Fresno or... Well, this country code is plus 34. I don't even know don't where even that know is. don't even know where that yeah. is, but there, Hong Kong or Britain or, or Holland, and there's somebody listening, and they either are so upset with something that we've said that they get to their computer and they type out a, an angry letter, or they're so pleased that they write or, or donate to the program, or they say, you ought to do a program on X. And I'll tell you what one just wrote. You, I think you read this one too. Said, why don't you do a program on this? If Jefferson came to Jenkinson oh, yeah. in 2016, what would he want to ask? What are the five questions he would ask? Kind of goes back to Dinner for Five, one of the classic shows. And right? he said, as, as a corollary to that, if Jenkinson went back to Jefferson, what are the five questions he would ask? And so we'll do that program. What If Jefferson came here, what do I think, what do we think Jefferson would want to ask us, not about ourselves, we don't matter, but about our world. And if we went back to... 1820 or 1810 or 1805, what are the five questions we would want to ask Jefferson? Mm -hmm. And so we'll do that program. But that's why I love the correspondence because I I never would have thought of that. The dinner guest program was another one. People say, and those are great, best question I ever had was from a fifth grader who said, now that you've had some time to spend with us, Mr. Jefferson, what would you like to take back with you? to the 18th century. And I just thought, bingo, you are on your way, young lady, fifth grader. Well, I don't know. I just looked this up as you were speaking, and it says country code 34 is Spain. 
So there's a Spaniard. I, but we'll, he'll, we'll find out, I hope. Uh, Richard, Richard Lyon. Lyon. But uh, echoing his words, the, 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 the show is um, completely, at this time, listener supported. 100% listener supported. And we're not going anywhere, but boy, do we need, we need you to support us to, to stay here. To stay here and to grow, because I've been watching the 2016 election beginning to unfold. So two things have happened. One is I've been watching the 2016 election unfolding. And, of course, I needn't say much about that except that it's a circus. But secondly, the Paris attacks in November really deeply troubled me, more than 9-11, because... As I said here, I think on one of our programs, 9-11 could be seen as a legitimate attack. Boy, careful how you say that. Somebody could take that out of context. Of course, but, but the World Trade Center is a symbol of America's economic and political and military hegemony. The, the Pentagon certainly is a legitimate attack if you, if you hate America and want to wage war against us. But, but what happened in Paris, people going about their business at a concert, having dinner on the Friday night, and just in, in cold blood – cutting down people who are absolutely innocent. If I'm the head of Monsanto Corporation or, or, or um, Standard Oil, I might be complicit in America's profile in the world. But if I am a person in France going to dinner on a Friday night, I am not complicit. Mm -hmm. That is the slaughter of the innocents. It cannot be justified. And it, it, it worried me more than 9/11 because i think if that's the if if now nothing is off limits mm -hmm. that's terrorism in the most fundamental sort and civilization is going to have to stand up it's going to have to it's going to have to reassert itself i don't necessarily mean militarily but anyway so and i think what the jefferson hour represents is a forum where we can discuss really important and interesting and troubling ideas in a civil manner with the code of Jefferson that that civil argument is the very essence of a democracy and that and the motto of our world should be uh, what Voltaire is said to have said madam I disagree with what you say but I shall defend to the death your right to say it that should be the the motto of the world and instead it's hey buddy I'll cut you down in a bar with my AK47 because you know what I hate the West, or sending a drone strike in on a marriage ceremony in, in Afghanistan, for that matter. And so we need a refuge of civility, a place where we can talk about the Second Amendment without going nuts, a place where we can talk about freedom of religion without going berserk, a place where we can talk about politics without either defending or hating Barack Obama or Mrs. Clinton or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz. And I think the Jefferson Hour is a is a is a safe zone. It's a demilitarized. It's a, it's a civic demilitarized zone, but it's punctuated by the philosophy of this gracious man, Thomas Jefferson. And I think that's why people should support it. Well said. And with that, shall we go to uh, Jefferson one o two? I liked one o two a lot. Me and too. I, and I'm now actually looking forward to one o three and one o four. Great. We'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, brought to you by Bismarck State College on the banks of the Missouri River at the heart of the Lewis and Clark Trail. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. Seated across from me this week is the gentleman who created the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. It is he who would be portraying President Jefferson were he here, but he's not here because we're talking about him. Uh, last week we did a show called Jefferson 101. This week we shall continue with Jefferson 102. Uh, we talked about Jefferson's life, and we started with him uh, as a small child. We talked about the influence of his mother, his father. We talked about the early education he received via his father's influence and his father's, I believe you said, 40 books. And we sort of ended with... Uh, the period where Jefferson went to college. So with that as a sort of an intro, uh, welcome to you, Mr. Jenkinson. It's great to be here in the year 2016, a year of great growth for the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And as you rightly say, we are working our way through Jefferson's life at the beginning of the year. We may interrupt this, um, but we'll continue until we have taken Jefferson into retirement and to the 
um, to the shores of his own death in 1826. But the early years are fascinating to me because, of course, if you agree with John Locke, and Jefferson certainly did, that we're born with a blank slate, that there, we come into the world with no preconceived ideas. There's no software that we have at birth, that we're just this absorptive creature. If, if you agree with Locke's view, then everyone becomes what their environment creates for them. If Jefferson had been born in South Africa, oh, it would have been a very different Jefferson. If he'd been born in Boston, Massachusetts, he would have been a very different Jefferson. If he'd been born uh, as a Lakota Indian, he would have met Lewis and Clark. Uh, but uh, he would have been a very, very different person. And so the fact is that Jefferson was born in Virginia at a certain time of a certain social position. His father was largely a self-made man of the overseer class, his hero Peter Jefferson, but he died when Jefferson was 14. His mother was of a very prominent social class, Jane Randolph. She died when Jefferson was 33. In fact, she died just a few weeks before he went to Philadelphia to write the Declaration of Independence. So he was bereft of his parents at a relatively young age. He had eight brothers and sisters. We don't learn very much about Jefferson's siblings, uh, but he was the only one of uh, destined for greatness. The others were, were typical Virginians. Uh, but Jefferson had something special about him. Either he was favored as the eldest child, or he was an unusually intelligent person, or he was just fortunate that his life was directed in a certain way and, and not in another way. And he actually addresses this, David. When he talks later in life about his father dying when he was 14. He says something like, when I reflect that my father died when I was thus young and impressionable and I didn't have another authority figure or adult figure to turn to, how many temptations I might have turned into. I might have become fond of horse racing or gambling or wenching or drinking or any number of other things. And he said, when I, when I recollect that I was essentially left alone to fashion myself when I was only 14 years old, I'm, I'm a little bit amazed that I did not turn off and become as worthless to society as many of them have become. Pretty strong statement. Really, it is. And I think it's true because the average Virginian was way more like Patrick Henry than like Thomas Jefferson, heavy drinking, wenching, Horses, gambling, racing, card playing, uh, social activity. And not just limited to the weekends. I don't no. Yeah. No. So these were this was a privileged class of planters who lived on the backs of African American slaves who didn't do much work. I mean Jefferson at one point said that no one in the South will work if he can get somebody else to do it for him. I think it's a very revealing Jefferson statement. said that? Yes. Huh. Well, He's writing about the North and the South, and he says that there, there are environmental differences between the hard scrabble New England and the voluptuous South, and he says, but, but in the South, nobody will work. Is so, that in a letter to yes, someone? Yes, yes. Huh. And so, and, I, and I, he's exaggerating, of course, but I think there's something to that, the indolent life of the rural squire, what, what in English literature and satire would have been called a rural booby. And Jefferson could have become that person. And then there's another key moment where he's talking about his friendship with Dabney Carr. So Dabney Carr was his closest friend. They were tutored together in a private school. Uh, they were blood brothers. Uh, it was with Dabney Carr that he was up on top of the mountain, which he later called Monticello. And, and they were lying on the top of the mountain um, as two extraordinary young friends. And they made a pact. He was very young at the time that whoever died first would be buried right there on top of the mountain. And then when the other one died at whatever point it, it occurred, he'd be buried right next to him. And so Dabney Carr, Jefferson's best friend, died when he was, I think, 34 years old, very young. And he was buried somewhere else. And Jefferson, with his usual type A squared personality, had him exhumed and brought to the top of Monticello and buried in what became the cemetery, 
the graveyard at Monticello. And when Jefferson died on July 4th, 1826, he was buried next to his boyhood friend, Dabney Carr. So it was one of those intense, young, adolescent You know, that, that, really, that says a lot about his character. His and romantic the, nature. Yeah, that's, that's the word I was looking for. He's that, a romantic. That's, that's a huge, uh, a huge uh, tell. It is a huge tell that he had him exhumed. I mean, it's one thing to make the pact. In that time. And when you think, well, maybe Dabney dies and he's buried and Jefferson learns of this and he thinks, well, he's been buried. That was, we were young. He gave his word. He gave his word and he kept it. And so they do spend eternity, even though Jefferson didn't believe in an afterlife, they spend eternity side by side. But he wrote this key letter about Dabney. Dabney married Jefferson's sister, one of his uh, siblings, and... Jefferson wrote this remarkable letter in which he says, well, he's brilliant, uh, he's an extraordinary man, but he seems to be content with just a small, modest um, cabin and a, ch- a few chairs and a table, and he's happy to eat bacon. And he, he presents this picture, which I'm sure is an exaggeration, but of the modesty of Dabney Carr's life, the, his, his modest expectations, his modest home, furniture, uh, personal tastes, and so on. And Jefferson says, huh, he seems to be content with that. That's wonderful. And you can hear him thinking two things. A, why am I not content with that? Because that's never going to be my life. I'm never going to live in a cabin. I'm going to live in a palace. I'm never going to eat bacon. I'm going to eat French cuisine. I'm never going to drink water. I'm going to drink the finest wines that I can afford. So even at this young age, Jefferson is observing his doppelganger, his best friend, and he's thinking, huh, he's so content with a modest life. A normal guy. I wonder what that would be like. You know, he, he praises it. He's almost, sort of, almost a little thorough in him thinking the simplicity, you know, modesty. And he's sort of looking at him, but you can tell not only is he thinking why – Am I not that person? He's also thinking, I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to be Jefferson, and I'm going to have cap. I'm going to have columns in my houses, and 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 lunettes, and arches, and architraves, and pediments, and entablatures, and I'm going to have sculptures made of Lafayette and Ben Franklin and George Washington, and I'm going to buy copies of the best paintings in the world, and I'm going to buy every book that I ever want, even though I have no money to buy them, and I'm going to get scientific instruments that I probably won't use very often, but I'm going to have them. I'm going to have furniture, some of which I'll design and have my slaves painstakingly make, and they'll get to the 90th point on it, and I'll make them take it apart and start over because I don't like some (laughs) little part of it. I'm going to have little sets of tools, and I'm going to have the best paper and the best writing instruments, and I'm going to design a kind of copying machine so I can make copies of everything that I ever write. I'm going to have elaborate garden books, and they're going to be grids, and I'm going to I'm going to spend time making graph paper, and then I'm going to write in what vegetables there are, and I'm going to put when they come to flower, and I'm going to have the best furniture that can be purchased and the be- the best clothing that I can have. And so he suddenly he's at this pivotal moment. You know, two roads diverge in a wood, and he sees Dabney Carr moving in a very traditional but modest direction as a Virginian. And then here's Jefferson, his doppelganger, his twin, and he's moving into this exquisite life in which Monticello is a world heritage site that people flock to from all over the world, whether they like Jefferson or know about him or not. The fact that it's Monticello, this glorious, whimsical, Palladian villa designed in the wilderness of America by America's da Vinci. I love to read that letter. We'll post it on the site, but it's a really remarkable letter in which he sees what he's not going to be. You've talked to me before about Dabney Carr and and their friendship. Yes. And, you know, of course, you read about it in many of the biographies of Jefferson. Um, but I must say still, even knowing uh, the first time I went to Monticello and walked to the graveyard and saw... Them together. It, it, it still, you know, it really... I don't know. I don't even know the word to say it, but it it had an, it had a great effect on me, and I think it's I think it does say a lot about Jefferson. He's a romantic. Kind of yeah, he's right. a loyalist and a romantic. And then you know he took under his wing Samuel and Peter Carr, uh, Dabney's children, Jefferson's nephews, and he raised them at his own expense. 
and he supervised their reading, and he arranged for their college educations, and he wrote them letters of advice about everything, including whether there's a God and how to think about religion and how to read the Bible and what books to have in their libraries. And as you know, for a very, very long time, the, the Carr brothers were, took the hit. They were the fall guys for the Sally Hemings story. The family, the family narrative after all that was that it was the Carr brothers who were sleeping with Sally Hemings. Uh, and there's, there's still discussion of that to this day. Yeah, we know that's not, we, that may be true, but that's not the source of Sally Hemings' children. And I doubt that it's true. But the Carr family is very deeply interwoven into Jefferson's later life in uh-huh. this way. You always get the sense that there's a little envy in Jefferson for a simpler life. He always longed for the simpler life, and he said he wanted it, and I I believe he meant it, but he only meant it in part because Jefferson was destined for international greatness. You are listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week we're discussing uh, Jefferson's life, and when we come back, we will send Mr. Jefferson to college, talk about that period of his life. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is normally portrayed by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, the gentleman seated across from me now. This week, it's Jefferson 102. Um, We're talking about Jefferson's life, and uh, when we took our break, we said we would take him to college. Correct? Indeed. So the first letter that we have from Jefferson. And keep in mind, as we said last week, that everything before 1770 is presumably lost, with very very few exceptions, because Shadwell burned. So we don't have his early correspondence. We pick it up when he's 16. And he writes it to John Harvey, who's one of his uh, guardians. Um, Peter Jefferson died when Thomas Jefferson was 14. And so there were guardians. And one of them is a man named John Harvey. And Jefferson writes to Harvey and he says, you know, I was talking this over with some friends at a Christmas party and it seems to me that I should probably go up to the college, by which he means the College of William and Mary. And he says, the, the advantages of this are that I'll save money, um, which of course is in the first letter that Jefferson ever wrote. He's talking about his money problems and he never, ever, ever, ever got over them. <laughs> he, 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 for The first letter that we have is about being frugal, and he fought this his entire life until he died at 83, and he could never get on top of his I, I have to ask you, do you did, did any of that come, do you think, from his earlier upbringing? Was, was, I mean, Peter, we've established, married up to the Randolph family. He did well. Um, so it didn't come from that, did it? His worry about money? No, the problem. Well, they were poor planters. They were they were land rich and slave rich and cash poor. And most Virginia planters were in debt because the British would extend all of this easy credit to a planter. And the planters of Virginia wanted to be like English gentlemen. They wanted to live like English gentlemen and have the same furnishings and the same books and the same musical instruments and the same clothing and the same uh, dishes and dinnerware. They wanted everything. They wanted to be like British rural aristocrats, or at least British rural gentry. And they knew what that was like because they had read their Addison and Steele and their Dr. Johnson and, and Jonathan Swift, and they and they knew what, what, what a, a person of prominence, a country squire in Britain was, and they wanted to be that on the frontier. They were very much British citizens and British colonials. 
They couldn't afford it. And we had no manufacturing in the United States to produce these things. We were really just the, the rawest of raw frontier countries, and so there, and especially in Virginia. And so they couldn't get any of these things that they so desperately wanted. George Washington is the key player in this. If you read his letters, he's constantly trying to ape and imitate British squires. The only way they could get these things is to, is to order them. Um, the Amazon.com of its time. And then go into debt. And then and the British yeah. merchants were only too happy to say, yes, we'll extend you credit because this enslaved the the planters to the British merchants. And so after a year, they'd be, well, you're, you're $11,000 in debt, but don't worry, you'll have a great crop. And then well, now you're $22,000 in debt. And this meant that they couldn't ever stand up. They couldn't strike for higher prices. They couldn't withhold their wheat or their tobacco from the market because they were always in this catch-up dependency situation. And Jefferson was a primary example of this. And it, it's worse with Jefferson because there are so many things that he couldn't live without. You know, books at the time cost about $250 in our currency. Musical instruments, scientific instruments, fine paper, furnishings, draperies, china, uh, silks, linens. Jefferson had to have all of it. He, 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 For some reason, he could never chasten his material desires, and he constantly just bought them whether he had the cash or not, and he borrowed money from everybody, his friends, from banks, from merchants, from – he borrowed from absolutely everybody. He could never pay it off, and about once every – Five or six years, I mean, this is literally true, but once every five or six years, he would wake up in the middle of the night and realize, oh, my goodness, I'm helplessly in debt. This is, a, this is, this is all going to collapse. And then he would make resolutions to get on top of it. I'm mean, going to never spend a penny until I get into cash flow and into the black. And then about three weeks later, he would just order books and wine and scientific instruments because he couldn't live without these things. And so Jefferson is maybe the worst example of a prominent figure in the colonial and early national period who became so addicted to the finery of life that he essentially bankrupted himself and did terrible damage. Because keep in mind, it's not just Jefferson. His daughter Martha, his only surviving daughter, had to live partly on charity in the last years of her life because he had left her so destitute. Monticello was lost his final of the three libraries was lost. After his death, his slaves had to be sold at auction to the highest bidder. I mean, it was a, it was not just like you or I dying bankrupt. That's neither here nor there. He was the patriarch of an empire, of a little industrial tobacco empire. And by being so fundamentally irresponsible, he left a lot of people in a very desperate circumstance, particularly his slaves, but more personally, his daughter. And he lost what is now a World Heritage Site, Monticello, because he was so impecunious. But here's the paradox. My whole theme about Jefferson is paradox. Here's the paradox, David. If he had lived like Dabney Carr, within his means, in a small cabin, with a handful of books, maybe one piano, maybe one violin, maybe one carriage, maybe a few horses, he couldn't have been Jefferson. Somehow, when we think of, using air quotes, when we think of Jefferson, we think of elaborate entablature, a magnificent second home at Poplar Forest, the finest carriages, one of the greatest libraries in America, the best wine connoisseur the country had seen up until the Civil War. When we think of Jefferson, he's inextricably bound up with his habits. And Monticello is a bankrupt's house, and Poplar Forest is a bankrupt's vacation house. And everything he did was done on a scale five, ten times beyond his income. But if he had lived within his income— in some important sense, he couldn't have been Jefferson. Whereas if you take John Adams, who also nearly went bankrupt and was bailed out by his son, John Quincy Adams, if he lived within his income, he's still John Adams. But Jefferson, almost alone amongst the founding fathers, could not be Jefferson 
if he lived within his means. Does that make sense? It's a weird paradox. That is a lot to respond to. I don't want to get into a, a, a debate right. about this, but I, I, I do question a couple of your assumptions. Okay, let's, let's hear it. Well, uh, and you can, and, 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 and with all respect. Of so, course. Of course. And, and, uh, and indeed. What I would say is tells. We talked earlier in this extended conversation about Jefferson and his study habits. Right. And that really tells us a lot about he as an individual. 10, 12, 14 hours a day, grinding out his studies in Latin When Greek most of his uh, friends who were far less disciplined... They're at the tavern. Right. They're, they're being young roustabouts right. or whatever. That's what people do. Okay. And then the next big tell is his romantic nature. Having Dabney Carr literally exhumed and burying him in the preordained spot at the graveyard at what will become Monticello. And I am certain if I if we did a show on Jefferson's romanticism, you could come up with an ending list of evidence of this. It's a long, long, long list. He always is telling somebody it's worth a trip across the Atlantic to paint the natural bridge or to paint, to see the, the confluence of the Shenandoah and the Potomac. You know, he's always saying something like, it's worth a trip across the Atlantic. Well, if you actually think about that, it's not worth a trip across the Atlantic to see <laughs> a minor arch in Western Virginia. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but he, but the, his romantic nature, I could make long lists of that. You're correct. Okay. And then the third one that I can come up with right now is his absolute willingness to share knowledge and do so with the utmost humility. Yes. And remember that we haven't mentioned this in terms of Jefferson yet in this series, Jefferson 101, last week. Jefferson 102 this week, that if you asked Jefferson, what is the purpose of life? He would have said to ameliorate the condition of mankind. In other mm -hmm. words, to make life better. He did write for that, others. did he? Yes. Yeah. And when Meriwether Lewis in his famous birthday meditation on August 18th, 1805 says that I have wasted my life and I have not been not properly prepared for this great mission. He said the two great purposes of life are to increase the knowledge of the succeeding ages or in, and to increase the happiness of man. Mm -hmm. That's Jefferson. That's the Enlightenment, to increase the knowledge of the succeeding generations and to increase the happiness, by which he means not hedonism, but, but general satisfaction of humankind. That's straight out of Jefferson. And that's what Jefferson intended to do. And so he used all of his mighty preparation, his intellectual, musical, political preparation to be a benefactor of humankind as he understood what a benefactor should do. But you don't have to have the best wines to be a benefactor. Right, which gets me to my point. We're talking about these tells. His studious nature, his romanticism, his willingness to share his knowledge with everyone and his great humility. And then we come up against, how could this brilliant man be such a fool when it came to money? Now, you talked about um, this letter he wrote when he was 16. To John Harvey, his, his first extant letter. And, and it's there. His concern yeah, about we, finances. We left that far behind, but he says it will save money if I go to the college. And uh -huh. Of course, it didn't. Uh -huh. After the first semester, he writes again to John Harvey and says, okay, I spent more than I thought I was going to, and you could take it out of my estate. And you know, already, it's this pattern that he sees yeah. something he wants and he I, can't I just, deny I want to go into that further. I feel like there's something to be learned, or maybe 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 you already know it and just haven't expressed it, but the, the this... He, he, all of these great things, and then when it comes to money, he's just an absolute failure. I mean, he, well, well, he is and he isn't. I mean, in the one sense, of course, he's a failure. With his own money, he's a failure. With his own Yeah, money. I'm not going to talk about his public life here. Yeah. Uh, but even in his own private life, he got away with it. Yeah. No one ever, no one ever foreclosed. And you, you're kind of saying that this was normal for people in his position. It was quite usual in Virginia, not as, not as uh, dramatically so as as was the case with Jefferson. The British merchants enslaved We're all too happy to enslave us economically in, a, in, in addition to politically. But most people were, were way more on top of this than Jefferson. Jefferson somehow, it goes back, to, and I think to that letter to Dabney Carr, Jefferson somehow conceived of himself as a certain type of person. That if, you're, if, the, if the transit of Venus is coming, you need a chronometer, you need a telescope, you need a sextant, you need a special notebook to record this in. 
And so I'll buy all those things. And, and he, he, one time he gets interested in the, in the, in the pseudo epic poems by a man named Oshin. Huh. This is a literary fraud of the 18th century. How do you carry all this around? There was, a, there was, a, there was, there was a Scottish guy named James McPherson, and he was an absolute fraud. And he, he, he quote unquote, discovered these ancient manuscripts about a, a, a Celtic. Oh, right. Epic. No, I, I do remember this. And, yeah. and, and it's very Jeffersonian stuff. You know, there's a man grieving on the shore of, a, of an ocean in, in, in the gloom. And it's all this heroic romantic stuff. And it was all fraudulent. And Dr. Johnson, the f- famous English lexicographer, saw through it. And he challenged McPherson to produce the, the manuscripts and he couldn't. And Dr. Johnson called McPherson a bully and he proved to the world that McPherson was a was a fraud. But Jefferson never really got over Oshin. And so he sends a letter to McPherson's brother. Somehow, you know, without... Without the without Google, he tracks down McPherson's brother in Great Britain, and he writes him a letter, and he says, "I want a, a fair copy of the manuscripts. I'll pay any price. It doesn't matter. Get the. I'll pay any price if you can get me manuscripts of Ossian." And then he says, "And also, as long as you're doing, can you send me a couple of Gaelic grammars and a Gaelic dictionary? And don't worry about the cost. Just do it." That's Jefferson. So you think, well, wait a minute. Let's say he gets all this stuff. It probably costs him. Five thousand dollars in our currency. Is it worth it? You know, for Jefferson, you of course you get the instruments to do the transit of Venus. Of course, you buy all the best books on America, so that you, when you send Lewis and Clark to the West, but, but you, you would really only them. do that if you felt you were above. You have to feel that you're entitled, right? And, and that's some, that's the word. Some part of Jefferson believed that he was entitled to the greatest pleasures. That life offers, and he, and he was not unique in that. I mean, uh, no, but it's it's so fundamentally irresponsible. Yeah, it because is. Because not only this, not only did he leave his daughter destitute, and she was his favorite human being, and the slaves had to be sold unceremoniously at auction, and he lost Monticello. But in addition to that, he cheated close friends out of their money. And the most famous case is Kosciuszko, the Polish patriot, right? who left the country and he, he left $10,000 with Jefferson and said, would you invest this for me because I'm leaving and I, I trust you to invest this and someday I'll call upon you for it. Jefferson says, of course, I'd be, that's what people do for their friends. Yes, you may entrust me with it. I promise to take great care of your estate. And the minute Kosciuszko leaves, Jefferson lends himself the $10,000. It doesn't even begin to cover his debts. You know, it's just, it's just like – a tiny pebble in a Pay, large stream. Interest, yeah. He's just just remaining solvent, and then he forgets all about it. And the, like fifteen or twenty years later, Kosciuszko writes him and says, "Say, I wonder how my ten thousand is doing. Would you send it to me? I have need of it now." And Jefferson says, uh, "I'll get back to you." And then he has to figure out who he's going to borrow from, so that he can pay back Kosciuszko. And then he borrows from some other friend. He's basically check kiting, and he cheated people out of their money, not like a desperado, but like somebody who didn't think it through. And so, yes, it's irresponsible. There's a sense of entitlement. It's somehow – there's an arrogance to this. It's a little like Mr. Magoo, if you remember the old cartoon. Oh, sure. It's just like he doesn't can't see reality. He can only see illusion. But – for Jefferson to behave in this way, I mean, just imagine for a moment that slave auction after Jefferson's death that had to be managed by his grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, his favorite grandson. And now it's all over. The great man is dead. Maybe his creditors indulged him while he was alive because they couldn't bear to foreclose on the great Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence. But now he's dead and we mm-hmm. want our money and we're going to Jeff, the grandson, we're saying we want the money. And Jeff has to sell off everything. Everything, right. including Jefferson's beloved family of slaves that he always talks about how he's going to do something right for them and that they matter to him and they're a family. And and suddenly he's dead and it just collapses, not only like a house of cards, like an avalanche. He might have died in debt no matter what. Most Virginia planters did and, and statesmen did. Monroe um, Madison, etc. But, but I think you will agree, David, and I think you more than I actually. There's just something fundamentally wrong about the way Jefferson did this. 
leave us not to judge, but it certainly is um, a key to a deeper understanding of the whole man, which is something we preach a lot about is judge the whole man. Well, it's an interesting subject, and I think it bears more examination by historians because I think that Living beyond your means is one thing. I do it. I'm, all of us do it. We have credit cards. You know, we, we have much better credit systems in our time than they had in theirs. And credit card problems are endemic in American life. We are a people who live beyond their means because our expectations are basically Jeffersonian of a dream house, a place in the country, <laughs> a golf cart, yeah. a horse. You no, know, we're, we're not that different. I we, shouldn't laugh. We're but, not yeah. that different. Yeah. But but there's something monumental about Jefferson's fiscal irresponsibility and. It had human damage. When I die, if I died a million dollars in debt, it's not going to hurt a single human being. But his death hurt people. Mm, that's an interesting statement. Well, uh, you're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're talking about uh, Jefferson the man. Uh, we're uh, going to take a short break. We almost got him to college. Yeah. <laughs> when we come back, we'll, uh, we'll pick it up with Jefferson at college. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week, we're talking about President Jefferson, uh, the show Jefferson 102. Seated across from me is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson. And before we get back to Mr. Jefferson and college, could you just wrap up the uh, the Harvey letter? Because we didn't quite finish that. The first extant letter to his uh, guardian, John Harvey, and he says... I'll save money if I go up to the college. He said, I'll get a better acquaintance. You know, it's networking. It'll probably be useful to me later in life. He says, and, and here, here's Jefferson's intellectual arrogance. He says, and I can probably learn math just as well there as I can right by myself here. <laughs> you know, so it's like I, there's nothing really there for me except social networking. But uh, OK, I'll go up. So he goes. Um, and he spends too much, of course. Almost the first thing he does at the gates is buy a copy of Andrea Palladio's Four Treatises on Architecture, which becomes his Bible of design. Monticello is a Palladian villa. Poplar Forest has Palladian elements. Uh, the, the capital at Richmond has Palladian elements. Jefferson was a profound Palladian, and he never got to see Palladio's world, but he came close when he when he went to Milan, but he he didn't go to Vicenza to see the actual sort of uh, central template of Palladio's architectural um, capacities. But anyway, he became a Palladian, and so that of course is going going to contribute to his debt in all sorts of other ways. But now he's at the College of William and Mary, and he doesn't like the college very much. Uh, it's in kind of a seedy condition. Intellectually, it's sort of third rate. There's been a scandal. Several professors have recently been fired. Uh, the There's an Indian school there that doesn't really operate. Um, Jefferson finds it very unpleasant, and he hates the architecture. And he says, and this offends people at William & Mary to this day, but he says, even of the famous Wren Building, one of America's great buildings, he says, but for the fact that there are roofs on these buildings, uh, people might mistake them for a brick kiln. <laughs> and so, you know, he's just, he's kind of scathing. Uh, they'll be so glad you brought that he, letter He's, up, he's yeah. a little bit above it all, you yeah. know. But he goes, and, and then something happens. He meets William Small. And William Small is a professor. He's there temporarily from England. He's part of the, the English and the Scottish Enlightenment. 
He's a very learned man, a witty man, a, con a congenial man, a figure of the, of the Enlightenment, a philosoph. He's sort of marooned in the new world. He's alone. He lives alone. And he meets this young genius, and he immediately realizes this is why we teach. And so he then becomes Jefferson's primary professor because several of the other um, faculties have been dismissed. And so he takes over the portfolio of literature and philosophy in addition to mathematics, his field. And so he becomes basically Jefferson's tutor for a couple of years, for three years. And Jefferson says in his autobiography that he set the destinies of my life. Uh, that this was this, this this was the pivotal moment when he his father is dead. He's done some traditional British reading. Now he goes off to college, sort of as a arrogant young man who thinks it doesn't have much to teach him. And then he meets William Small and he realizes there's a whole world out there that this man understands and he can help me understand. And it's breathtaking. Man is rational. Man is good. The Bible is probably not the inspired word of God. It's okay to be a deist. It's okay not to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, humans are understandable. The, the universe is understandable. Newton is the greatest man who ever lived. We should all be Baconians and work by induction. Suddenly, Jefferson is exposed to French philosophical and Enlightenment thought, Scottish Enlightenment thought, British Enlightenment thought, there's this breathtakingly clear and, and brilliant mentor who wants Jefferson to be his companion. They became friends in addition to everything else. And this is really, for Jefferson, the moment when he ceases to be a typical Virginian and becomes a citizen of the world and one of the best educated men in American history. And he, he rightly uh, celebrates the work of William Small if Small had not come to the New World, it might have been very different. Small left shortly after Jefferson finished at William & Mary and went back and soon died. If this conjunction, like the conjunction of planets, is critical to understanding Jefferson, and he was modest enough to say, this is the guy. This is the one who made the difference in my life. Hmm. I would assume that – I know some does, but I would assume there's a fair amount of correspondence between the two that have survived. A little. But the problem was, of course, they were together. And when you're together, you don't need to write. You, know, you don't write across the campus. Um, and then William Small went back and he died shortly thereafter. Went back. To, to, to Great Britain. Uh -huh. And so there, we have a very small body of, of exchanges. So mostly we know about William Small. Rather than through, and we know about William him. Small. We know about William Small because of he was part of two reasons. One is Jefferson writes about him for the rest of his life and talks about how important he was, including this famous passage where he quote set the destinies of my life. Mm -hmm. But secondly, Small was part of this is a digression we don't want to get into. We should do a show on it. But he was part of something called the Lunar Society in Birmingham, England. Right, and the Lunar Society met on the full moon. It included Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather. It was all these luminaries who were people just like Jefferson and William Small. Yeah, you, you brought that up before, and I agree we shouldn't get it's, onto it's that because we'll be there a long it's time. It's called the yeah. Lunar Society, and I actually am a member of the American chapter of the International Lunar Society. I'd like to see your card, if I might. I, and and my, my mentor, one of my mentors, Ev Albers, was the founder of the American chapter of the International Lunar no Society. No kidding and, on that. And, I did and, not and we held... Lunar Society meetings in a, an open-air Chautauqua tent in Montana. And I can remember the night of our first great meeting where there were 12 of us and Ev presided and he gave a biographical sketch of Erasmus Darwin, which was absolutely drop-dead funny and brilliant. And we were under a full moon along the Yellowstone River in Montana under a Chautauqua tent that seats 800. And this was the founding event of the American chapter of the International Lunar Society, which still exists in a, in a fragmentary form. Huh. And so this was William Small. So we know a fair amount about him through the Lunar Society uh -huh. and then some about him through Jefferson's later reminiscences. Okay, so we have Jefferson at William and Mary for a period of how long and then what Three happened? Years. And then where did he go to next? So then Small, who was an extraordinary man, 
was lonely, and he was a friend of the governor, the colonial governor of Virginia, Francis Fauquier. Jefferson said the best governor Virginia ever had. And he had another friend named George Wythe, spelled W-Y-T-H-E, George Wythe. And Wythe was maybe even more extraordinary than William Small, self-taught Greek scholar, a legal theorist, a classicist, a extraordinary man. And he then became Jefferson's law tutor. So Jefferson read law for five years with George Wythe, who lived in Williamsburg with his wife, after William Small had done what he could for Jefferson at the College of William and Mary. And in addition to all of this, the four of them, Governor Fauquier, the ablest governor ever in Jefferson's mind, his first great mentor, William Small, and his second great mentor, George Wythe, they had dinner parties at the governor's mansion, just the four of them. Imagine this. A a colonial governor of the most prosperous state in America, colony, the most, maybe the greatest classicist in Jefferson's experience, George Wythe, and his, his law preceptor, William Small, the man who turned his life, and the four of them have these dinner parties at the governor's mansion in, uh, on, the du- on Duke of Gloucester Street in Williamsburg, and Jefferson is by far the junior partner. He's 18 or 19, and he brings along his violin of which he's adept because he's Jefferson, and they all play instruments, and they sit around after these dinner parties drinking punch <laughs> and playing music and having, and Jefferson said that, that he had the finest conversations that he ever had or heard in his life were at the governor's mansion. Oh, we all have those when we're 18, don't you think? Yeah, uh, well, this is pretty serious. Yeah. And, and he said that it was, he said it was like an attic Society it was like Athens in the age of Socrates. It was uh-huh. an Attic society, and that he is this this pitiful junior member was allowed was lifted by these three great men as a kind of an equal, uh, and he then went to these parties and he learned how to be a gentleman, how to be a conversationalist, how to be gracious, how to um, to balance an evening between alcohol and conversation and music. He, he learned to be Jefferson in a sense. During this period, so but, but this would be another what I call tell is he would not have been there had he not belonged. Right, they Williams. I mean, there were a lot. There were hundred and some boys. Small's word would not have put him there had he not belonged. No, right? Small saw something in Jefferson. He helped shape that, but he saw something in Jefferson that was already there, and he then realized Jefferson is the kind of person you want to put in touch with George with. And, you know, maybe I'll bring him along to the governor's house for one of these dinners. So this was after three years at William and Mary. Well, during that period, right. Or is during that Late period. in that period. But but after three years at William and Mary, he did what? He stayed in Williamsburg and read law. There were no law schools then. So you read law with a practicing lawyer. And that practicing lawyer would take time to say, read this and this and this and this and this and come back tomorrow. So it wasn't a matter of, you know, take your boards, here's your license. No. You just had to educate That's what Patrick Henry did. Patrick Henry studied six weeks and and wrote the law exam, and George Wythe refused to sign the exam. So there was a law. There was There was a bar exam. Oh, there was. Okay. And, And George Wythe would not credit Henry because he said, how can you become a lawyer in six weeks? Meanwhile, Jefferson, at the other end of the spectrum, spent five years reading 15 hours a day. And in addition to that, George Wythe spared him the degradation of apprenticeship. Normally, a young law student who's reading with a, with a, a practitioner basically does his work for him. He writes his briefs. He does legal research. He, ta- he carries documents to the courts. So normally the the mentor exploited the student in, in these situations like an apprentice. Well, yes. But but with refused to do that with Jefferson. He said, "No, no, no. I know how to do that. What I want you to do is read." And he said to Jefferson, "Spend the best hours of every day reading in the humanities. Philosophy, Greek, Latin, literature, political theory, history. Spend your best hours doing that every day." And then when your mind is a little tired, turn to law. <laughs> because he said, as a practicing lawyer, you will master the law. It comes with the territory. You have to. You'll learn on the job. But you can never learn 
what you don't learn now in terms of the deep liberal arts and humanities tradition. And so he then encouraged Jefferson to... Most Virginia planters learned some Latin, but not enough to really get along in it. But they could puzzle their way through a few texts. And they learned a smattering of Greek so they could show off at dinner parties and you know, know a couple of Greek phrases. Uh, but Jefferson, thanks to his own genius and thanks to George Wythe, took them both to the nth degree. And Wythe said, you may as well master them. You come this far, you may as well really master them. And so Jefferson then did master Latin and Greek and French and Anglo-Saxon and Spanish and Italian and a little German and a little Gaelic. And this was largely due to the, the quality of his mind, his brain pan, to his early um, upbringing because his father wanted him to be classically educated and to these two great interventions, we can call them, one by William Small, who taught Jefferson the Enlightenment, and the next by George Wythe, who taught Jefferson the, the history of the law, plus languages on the side. And so that's that's the formation of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, this is pretty good. We've got him uh, up to his 20s. He's, he's reading law in now. In Williamsburg. And it, his age would have been 20... He's 23, 24, right in there. And... Um, when we when you say reading law for the studying benefit, law for the benefit of the rest of us, he wasn't in a courtroom. He wasn't filing briefs. He, he was sometimes studying. Did. He did, but mostly he was alone in his rooms or alone in the offices of George Wythe, which would have been in his home, uh, reading very very difficult legal tracts. And was he was he he was uh, an assistant to Wythe? Was he paid? No, he no he wasn't paid. He had to he had to. He got free room and board, but he from he, with from with. But he had to supply all of his transport. He had to buy his own books. He although he borrowed books from With's library. So no, how how did he support himself? Do because he's, he has a plantation back there that someone some so, overseer is running for him. So somebody would send him. He had a stipend which uh-huh. he overspent. <laughs> of, <laughs> of course, course. of course, been, he overspent. We've, we've been there before. And even in Williamsburg, there was ready credit at the bookshop and at the musical instrument shop. So, how long did his apprenticeship last with Wythe? For five years. For five years, for and five that years. was a planned specific amount of time. Well, no, because you could do it in a year, you could do it in three years, but they decided, let's really do this. Five years. That's spent, a long time. That's read the humanities. That's, that's at least double what a normal, like John Adams didn't spend five years by years. So when he left with in Williamsburg, he would have been? 26 or 7. And what happened then? Well, then, he, then he's going to go back to Albemarle County, and he's going to be a planter. He's got, he's got one important thing he needs to take care of here. What might that be? Hmm. No woman. Mm-hmm. That's a whole different chapter in Jefferson's life. Yes. But, of course, he's adolescent, and so his hormones are raging, and he also is seeing his friends marry off, uh-huh. and so that's a serious, maybe next time unresolved we'll question that, in yeah. Jefferson's love life. But he's uh, he's a wealthy planter, already in debt. His father is dead. His mother is alive. They live at Shadwell, but he's 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 restless there. Plus, he doesn't think Shadwell is very well designed. It burns in 1770. So he's still a very young man at the time of the burning. Now he thinks, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rebuild a house for my mother, of course. She has to have a house. She lives till 1776. But I'm going to build myself a dream home, and I'm not just going to put it down on the river that, as most people do. I'm going to build on that mountain where Dabney's buried, and I'm going to level that mountain and create a, a Palladian rural villa using the highest classical style for myself on a mountain in Virginia. You know, we really don't probably have time this week to get into this, but we've had questions from listeners about Jefferson's love of architecture. We've talked about that in the past, but uh, maybe Jefferson 103, we can you can delve into a little bit about where that came from, where his training started, because I think that's fascinating. In 103, we'll talk about Jefferson the lover and Jefferson the architect, and how these things coalesced in January of 1772 when he brought his new bride to Monticello, which wasn't finished, and they had a bottle of wine that was hidden behind some books in the tiny library there. So that's where we'll pick it up in 103. You're listening to the Jefferson Hour. We'll see you next week. 
for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.